was 15, I was feeling really low and lonely. I found it difficult to interact with people, and I wasn't sure why. I'd been bullied at school because people thought I was different, and I spent a lot of time on my own. I was always on social media apps on my phone. I enjoyed making new friends online as I found it easier than talking to people face to face. It made me feel less lonely. I used to add people that I didn't know. So when I got a friend request from a girl that I didn't know, I added her like always. I don't know how she got my phone number, but I had previously put my phone number on Facebook asking people to add me, but that was a while ago. We talked a lot for a few days about general things and built up a friendship. I thought she was cool. Except she kept asking and asking for me to send her a naked picture. I don't think I'm very pretty and didn't want to send her any pictures, but she kept asking and I didn't want to lose her as a friend, so I did it. But after I did it once, she kept asking for more. When I said no, she threatened to put the one she had on Facebook. I was scared and didn't want my friends and family to see it. At first, I didn't hear anything for a couple days, so I didn't think she was going to do anything with it, but then I heard she'd set up a group under my name with the naked picture of me on it. I wasn't friends with her on Facebook anymore, but because she put my name in the group name, anyone who searched for me found it. I wanted to die. I met Tommy online when he started following me on TikTok. He always commented on my videos and told me how pretty I was. We DM'd and he told me he was 16, but the police told me later he was 44. We became friends and he asked me to start making him private videos. At first it was just dancing, but then he asked me to take my shirt off. I said no, and then he said he knows where I live. I got really scared, so I told my parents, and then we called the police later that night. During their investigation, the police discovered that Tom had befriended several other girls online. He was a bad man. I feel proud of myself that I said something to my parents. I was a big gamer on Fortnite, and I was really good at winning. I chatted with all sorts of people online, all over the world, while I was playing on my Xbox. It was a lot of fun. The people I chatted with would often ask me for my Snapchat and would add me on there. We chatted on both the Xbox and Snapchat. They often asked me to log in as them on Xbox so I could win games for them, and they offered to pay me for winning using cash apps. Sometimes they would ask me to video myself playing Fortnite and send them the videos. I knew that the people I was chatting with and playing with were older men, but I didn't care. I felt popular, and I was making bank. I only knew their first names, and it was a really easy way for me to make money. One guy wanted a naked picture of me playing Xbox as a joke. I, I did it. Next thing I know, the guy is telling me that if I don't give him my parents' credit card information, he's going to share that picture with all my gaming connections. And It was like 2 in the morning, and I was in my parents' room trying to steal my mom's wallet. She woke up and caught me. My dad was so angry. We called the police, and they pretended to be me and caught the guy. Let's just say I am very picky about who I game with now. I never give out any personal information or log in as anyone else. I love to dance, so I downloaded the app called Musical.ly on my iPad and created a lot of videos of me dancing and singing. I got a lot of attention and thought, maybe one day, if I did a good enough job on the videos, Maybe I'd be discovered and become famous. I earned online prizes and got a lot of private messages. Sometimes guys would send pictures of their penis, which was gross at first, but then I didn't care because I got way more compliments from them than from my own family. One guy asked me for my direct phone number. I think I may have watched a scary movie around the same time or something, because I had a very, very bad feeling about this guy. So I told my mom. My mom pretended to be me and told the guy I would call him if he gave me his number, which he did right away. Mom gave the number to the police and my gut was right. He was a registered sex offender. The police found him and arrested him. Mom and I learned a lot. Now, we eat dinner together at the table with no phones allowed. We actually talk and stuff. It's pretty cool. 
I was playing online with another kid. Sometimes we'd play all night until I heard my parents' alarm clock. He was the best to play with. One night, he told me that he could see my computer's address. I didn't know what that even meant. He told me that anyone who knew how could take that address, hack the computer my parents bought me, get all the banking information, and take every penny my family had. He was laughing about it, so I didn't freak out but I definitely didn't want anyone else to see the address. I asked him how to fix it. He said it was easy, that he could fix it for me. He told me to download Skype, help me to do it. Then he told me to do other things so he could watch. He told me if I didn't do what he said, that he could steal all of our money. I thought I was protecting my family, so I did it. Then he asked me to bring other kids to my room. That's when I told my dad. Dad told mom, then the police came. We found out that this guy had done this to 700 other kids in Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Vermont. He lived in Canada, but they still arrested him. My parents changed the rules about gaming in my room. We also learned a lot about online safety. Wish I would have learned this stuff before. Just saying. So that was some heavy stuff. Interesting that all of those are stories from Maine. Um, and I think, to put it in perspective, the intention is to give you guys strategies should you ever encounter something of this nature. And what is the next step? Who are your five people? What I find interesting when you were asked that question is the people that you mentioned that I heard, the names I heard, are all teachers. The first thing that you can count on at this school is the adults. And what resources we have at St. Dom's, we don't have a school resource officer. We don't have a school psychiatrist or psychologist. But we do have some pretty incredible teachers who have been trained and are mandated reporters, which means that they then take it to the next step. They're like legally obligated to do that. And that just means that they talk to um, an administrator, myself, um, or another individual who can then contact authorities and intervene on your behalf. Certainly, your parents are your best support and your family, um, but I think your five people you could probably find sitting right amongst you in this room. I also want to include for you guys the adults that work with you outside these walls, particularly your coaches. A lot of you have really strong relationships in your athletic fields. And those are also people who have been trained through um, both school uh, trainings as well as the diocese has all of the people who work with our youth go through a protecting God's children training. And again, it helps us understand as adults what are our next steps to support you. So I want to make sure that you hear that message from me today. Certainly, you're always welcome to come to the principal's office. Um, and I will never, and nor will any of your um, teachers or adults, make you feel any shame for any of the information that you might be sharing, because that's a pretty bold and brave step if you're ever put in that position. And our job is to help you work through that and to make it right. Um, so that's my piece for our community. And I know that um, Catherine indicated we have more information for you that exists outside of these walls as well. So this is Beth. Are you using this? Yeah. Okay. Hey guys, my name's Beth. I'm not nearly as cool as Allison was. And I will only take a few minutes of your time. But there's other options for public schools as well, and I know you guys have events, and you might college, whatever, if you don't stay here. So some schools have school resource, school resource officers. Um, but I'd like to say first, every single adult that comes into this school or any school is a mandated reporter, even if they're a volunteer. So we always encourage you to have your five people it, but it might not be the teacher, it might be the janitor, it could be the lunch person, 
it could be the person that opens the door for me today. It doesn't matter who it is, but I hope everyone in this room right now can think of someone they'd feel safe going to and telling any of this stuff, which isn't comfortable, no matter what school you're at. Um, and if you don't, if you can't think of somebody, you need to really work on that. Um, I spent my years working in the youth jail with kids, um, running, managing it, and a lot of the kids that would come in, if they had not been embarrassed, not been ashamed, not scared, not afraid they were gonna be bullied, judged, not be able to play sports, not go to school, if they had taken that option to go to somebody they trusted, could have stopped things from just going downhill um, real quick, and they would end up in jail, trafficked. Um, there's so many resources out there. So if something's happening to you on your phone and you're not at school, um, it's important to reach out to anybody because they are definitely uh, mandated reporters. And it's gotta be embarrassing. Like, or sometimes shame goes with it, or it's tough. I mean, I'm old and I wouldn't wanna have to go tell my husband or my friend, like, listen, I'm online and someone sent, you know, whatever. But I just take that option, even if you know what's happening to somebody else, because not everybody has a strong personality. If you know what's happening to your friend or anybody else, tell someone, because the right people can get it taken down and take care of the person that is doing this. And they're probably doing it like the videos. Very rarely is it just one person that they're doing this to. Most of the time, it's several people. And every public school is supposed to have a plan of what to do, a plan of action on how kids report so that they're not, um, that it's kept confidential, they're not judged, they don't miss their schooling, they don't miss um, playing sports or any of those things. Um, and just, I know there's a fear of getting in trouble, there's a, there's a fear of you know, being judged, a fear of your peers, if your peers find out, but prevention is, is the key. It is the number one thing you can do have open conversations, and like I said, it can be with anybody. And for the kids in Maine, 13 to 24, there is a line that you can call and report things, and they will talk to you and help you and get you in the right direction, whether it's you know local police, federal, homeland security. Um, and it's, they have people staffing it that are 18 to 24, probably with the thought that you can communicate easier. Um, but definitely listen to what Allison said, listen to what we've all said, and please be the voice in the schools. And if there isn't a school resource officer, it doesn't have to be that. And their job is to keep you safe and allow you to still attend school, attend sporting events, because that was a big thing that the kids that were coming to jail, they didn't, they didn't want to tell at first because they they didn't want to miss school. They didn't want to not be able to be on the cheerleading team or the basketball team or the football team. And boys, there was a lot of boys that came in that had things done to them too. So it's not just the girls like a lot of people think. It happens to, can happen to anybody. So please, 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 if you don't have a list of people right now, the five people, work on that and, and have five people. And it doesn't have to be your teacher, it can be, but it can be anybody that's in this building. So I hope you have a good time. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. I think Allison's going to come up and she's going to close out this last part for you. So just a few things. I'm, I was really sitting in the, in the back um, before I was speaking, and the prayer that was used today was the prayer, the words that I heard prayed were about justice, we're about peace. And a big part of the work that we try to do when we respond to this stuff is about justice and peace. And we, as I said before, we can't always choose what happens to us. We can choose what we do about it. And some of that means being a person who believes in justice and believes in peace before you know that there's a problem. Statistically, and it depends 
on the study and, and, and whatever else, but we know that there are a lot of young people who've already experienced abuse in their lives. And it, it depends on the data. It's usually one in six to one in 10 boys, one in three to one in four girls. Our GLBTQIA plus kids tend to be victimized at the same rate or more than their peers. And so it's like one in three, one in six, one in 10. I'm less worried about the numbers. I'm more worried about the fact that we create a world where if a kid has a problem, they can tell. And part of that is how we act. So the example that I'll give one of my best friends growing up was abused when we were in, I want to say fifth grade by a chaperone on a trip um, that we took that wasn't in our, in our city. So we, we went on this trip and he was abused by a chaperone. He didn't tell anybody until we were in 10th grade. Um, he told his girlfriend in 10th grade because he said any time that this kind of stuff came up or was talked about, people would like roll their eyes or like nudge the person next to them or laugh and be like, uh, you know. And he's like, I just never knew who I could tell because <clears throat> I was so worried that someone was going to respond in a bad way. And he's like, when I was in 10th grade, my girlfriend, I did feel like she would respond in a good way, and she did. She got his parents involved, um, and a report was made for the first time from something that happened when we were young, when we were teenagers. But it's that idea of how we act at, is important um, because we don't know what the history is of people around us. So I work with little kids sometimes. If a kid hurts themselves in the playground, I don't like ask them, do you have any bloodborne pathogens? Do you have anything in your pockets that might hurt me? Like, I'm gonna throw on gloves, I'm gonna deal with the injury, we're gonna move on. In the same way, you don't have to sit with the, your friends and ask like, have any of you had drama histories Have you been hurt on the internet? It's just treating people in the same way that you would wanna be treated, it's empathy. So when we're talking about these things, just be aware that people are paying attention. When I'm talking with little ones, like fourth and fifth graders, I, I, sorry, fourth, third and fourth graders, I talk about when I'm talking about body safety stuff, I say be really careful when you leave this room about making jokes about this kind of stuff because you don't know who's listening. So that's the first part about being justice-minded is to be aware we don't know everybody's history. The second piece is I kind of quickly talked about consent because I was, we we're trying to get through things quickly. And I think that there were some questions about what I meant by that. And I heard some, some chats about that. So the big important thing is to make sure that anything that we do that is romantic, the other person is comfortable. There was that story about that seventh grader that I used where she felt like she had no choice but to send a picture. We don't want to be the person who puts her in that position. We want to make sure that anything that is done that both people are equally as excited about and that we're not pushing someone to do something that they don't want to do. So that's what I meant by that. And um, that's important and will continue to be talked about as people get older and in more in depth as you're older. But that's just a baseline of when it comes to we don't want to be the person causing harm. I go into jails and prisons to talk about victim rights and, and crimes against kids and things like that. And I was at a prison pre-COVID. I haven't gone to a prison since COVID. Um, but I was talking, and someone in the back raised his hand for the Q&A part. And I called on him, and he said, do you remember me from high school? And I did. I said, oh, yeah, I did. He's like, great, just saying hi. I was not expecting in prison to have someone in the back be like, remember me from high school? And I was like, oh, and here's the thing. We, we are all our own experiences. We're all our, our choices. We want to make choices that put us in a position to help and not to hurt. Part of that's online. Part of that's in person. And part of that is being the interrupter. Cyberbullying is something that you may all have dealt with more so than some of the other things that I've sent, said. Cyberbullying it isn't about going after the person causing the harm. That usually escalates. That usually makes it worse. How do we support the person being targeted? I collect stories about that so because it's much easier to tell stories than to like um, use a broad sense. So a few examples of what I mean. So there's a high school in Canada called King's Central Rural High School. I always want to get it right because it's a long name. But people, it's important to get school names right. So a ninth grader showed up to the first day of school wearing a pink shirt. Not a big deal. Pink shirt, fine, whatever. There's some other boys who called, called him names and caused a big problem because he was wearing pink. So we go back to that triangle I used before when I talked about like the tip of the iceberg is the person being harmed. They have the least ability to change things. The two groups that have the most ability to change things are the people doing the harming and the people watching. 
So what I could tell that kid if he called our hotline, he didn't. But like, so some of the advice adults may give him is like, well, don't wear pink, da 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 da. That's not helpful. He should be able to be what he wants to be and wear what he wants to wear. It shouldn't be a big deal. So you spread that out. You can find the other ninth grade boys who are calling him names and figure out why that is and work on that. But in this case, it was the seniors. The seniors, Ryan and Travis, were sort of the two leaders of this movement. But they said, you should be able to go to school and wear what you want to wear and be what you want to be and believe what you want to believe without feeling unsafe. This is, and I think their exact words, if I remember the quote, was like, doing this over the color pink just seems so stupid. So they went home, they, made, they texted, they got online, they made calls, they went to Ragstock. The second day of school, every senior showed up wearing a pink shirt. <clears throat> so you walk into Central Kings Royal High School, every senior is wearing pink. So you think about the ninth grade boy who had been targeted, and he walks in to see every senior in pink. You think about the ones doing the targeting, the ones causing the harm. You show up the next day, every senior is in pink. This shows who owns the culture, who shapes the culture. And in this case, it was the leaders who had nothing to do with what was going on who went from being a bystander to being an upstander and to say something, to do something. The tricky thing, though, is as I said, the diffusion of responsibility shows more people watching something bad happen, the less likely someone helps. But science says, when they study diffusion of responsibility, if you've practiced, if you've thought about what you would do, you're more likely to do something. If you think, hey, if people are being mean online, here's what I would do. If I walk in on someone being bullied, here's what I'd do. If a friend of mine is in a relationship that has moved from caring to controlling really quick, here's what I would do. If you have a plan, you're more likely to engage in that way. Now, sometimes life just happens. We had a case in Minnesota. As I said, kidnappings are very, very, very rare. We had a case of a little girl who was kidnapped by a woman at a laundromat. Long story, but she was taken because this woman wanted her to be her child and brought that child home. And we had the, they had the license plate number. So they aired that license plate number everywhere. And it was the first case in Minnesota where it was from a cell phone recovery. A teenager who had a cell phone, she was in her home and she heard the Amber Alert go off. She thought, what's the likelihood of this car being mine? I'll just go out and check. You can have the choice to be a bystander or upstander. She's like, I'm just gonna go out and look. Who knows? So she comes upstairs, she's up downstairs. I just went and looked and before she went back downstairs and the car was parked in the street, kitty corner to her house. The license plate of the missing kid. So she called her dad at work and was like, dad, this is currently going on. He called 911, police came and they rescued that little kiddo and she was brought back to mom. And it's just that idea about she did not have a plan for that. She did not have a plan for that. But she, it is that idea about making the choice to do the right thing. And there are different ways that you can make the choice. You can create a distraction, right? Like the example that I'll use, there's a very famous case in Steubenville, Ohio um, that was very all over the media because it was um, Snapchatted and recorded by the people who were there. So it was, but it was basically a, they were having a party of a football, a party for the football players in the basement of a coach's home. And a girl from another school came to that party. She was intoxicated. She was, she was passed out. And the people at that party caused her harm while she was there. Um, the argument was, why didn't any of the football players go up one flight of stairs to the coaches and be like, hey, can you come and help this girl who's down here? She needs help. But instead, the other people at the party were videotaping and Snapchatting what was happening as it played out. It became very famous. There were multiple documentaries about it because the hackers group that's called Anonymous, it's a group of people who use their internet powers for hacking and, and the like, went after each of the people in that room and released all their information on the internet about where they live, who their siblings were, all that kind of stuff. So they were facing criminal charges, the hackers for doing that, so in some cases more than what happened. So it's a very famous case. So we look at that case, we think about creating a distraction. Any one of the people in that basement could have been like, hey, I think your car's being towed. Let's go check. And in that moment, changing the narrative, making sure someone's with that girl, making sure an adult's involved, is just creating a distraction. Another one is just asking for help, going up a flight of stairs, right? Another one is referring to someone else 
to help you. Finding a friend, it's much easier. Sorry, refer to an authority. So like find a coach, find a friend. Last one is enlist friends. It is far easier to stand up for things when you have a group of friends standing up with you. So enlisting other people can be really helpful. And here's the thing, you might not know whose life you've changed. There was, a, there was an article, I speak all over, so sometimes there's like an article about me speaking somewhere, and someone put up an article about me speaking, and a lady wrote underneath the article, she's like, oh, Allison is, is a speaker, that's great. When we were little kids, we were in YMCA together, and she was really nice when the older kids in the swimming class were being bullies to me. She stood up for me to help, them, help that stop. I have no recollection of this whatsoever. I don't know how old I was, I don't remember this at all. And her profile picture was just like of a flower, so I couldn't like dig in to figure out who she was. And I was like, okay, all right. Like, I have no idea who she was, but apparently in that moment, I did something that was helpful. You all in your experiences, I'm sure can think of one person who is not related to you, who did something really nice for you at some point. Maybe someone whose name you didn't even know. And those moments, those ripple moments, are moments that make a big difference in the lives of people who are feeling unsafe and who are feeling scared. And sometimes it is that ripple that might make that person upset. I've talked a lot, and the other speakers have talked a lot, about getting other adults involved. This is probably not going to surprise you. Sometimes your friends don't want you to get adults involved in your life. Like, that's a hard thing to do. But it is the good friend thing to do. So part of my job when I'm not speaking is I work as an advocate. An advocate is someone who, when people get it over their head online, call and ask for help. Um, and then often I see them through the court process, make sure that they can do their victim impact statement, things like that. Well, two of the things that I've learned doing victim advocacy is we don't have a very good culture that's set up to make victims feel comfortable to talk. Some of the biggest, bravest heroes I know are people who are victimized and they say never again. Some of the biggest, bravest heroes I know are people who've come forward and said something. But I work with kids who say, Allison, I never said anything because I did something wrong. I was supposed to yell. I was supposed to scream. I was supposed to show my parents what I saw on the internet and I kept it a secret because I was scared of this person. Or, more common, I really care about this person and I don't want to see them get into trouble. And so we as a culture have to shift that culture to make it easier. We don't usually call people victims anymore. We call people survivors if they've survived crime because victim implies some like damage or some weakness and that's not the case. We usually use the word survivors. And so we can create a culture where survivors can do a better job of speaking up. And part of that is being a good friend, but also knowing your limits and your boundaries I had a case of two girls who were in middle school. One of them was chatting with someone online, and he said, I would really like to come to your house and take you out for dinner. She thought that sounded awesome. She told her next door neighbor, and her next door neighbor said, that sounds really dangerous, so I will go with you. Because I want to be a good friend to you, I will go with you. When this 28-year-old person came to their house to pick up daughter, to take her out to dinner, he then also picked up the next door neighbor who was there with the intent of keeping her safe. He did not keep them safe. He brought them to his parents' house um, where he then had control. He then had power, which wasn't good. Luckily, every state has what's called the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. Every state has one. It's when you report to local police that there's a problem when it comes to the Internet, they get the information about it, and they are usually either ahead investigators or assist local police in these investigations. So the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. It's wonderful when we have folks doing the right thing on behalf of kids. Went um, and were able to trace the information. I've had cases of kids who've been, who've been reported missing who've taken the thumb drive, or not the thumb drive, the hard drive out of the computer and put it in their backpack because the abductor tells them to do that. Even when that happens, ICAC can trace other online trails of evidence. It's difficult. But when it was the, like the name of the game today being undeletable, there are ways of getting data when it's been saved. That's why when someone says, like, send me a snap and I'll delete it, or send me this and I'll delete it, someone could have taken a picture of it, someone could have screenshotted it, someone else could have downloaded it. And it also often lives on the server or in other places. 
So in this case of these two girls, law enforcement were able to figure out where the guy was, where he lived, and were able to rescue both of them alive, thank goodness. As I said before, 97% of missing kids get found. But it was one of those cases where she was trying to do what she thought was the right thing as a friend. And when you see someone is in over their head, have any, are any of you in this room trained as lifeguards? Nice. We have like, so if we had like a pool party right now, we'd have like two people who could save our lives. Great. I feel very safe. Um, but no, they teach you in lifeguarding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's that idea of you do not want the person who's drowning to pull you under. So you have to figure out your strategies so that the person who is drowning will not pull you under. Her friend was drowning. You can stay on solid ground and help by throwing something, by getting adults, without going into that same water with her. The other piece about lifeguarding that I'll use as an analogy, I worked at a church camp in college in the state of North Carolina. It was glorious. I loved those years. Um, I'm, a, I'm a decent swimmer. I have no complaints about my swimming. But I was on the dock swimming, not swimming, watching the children. And I was wrestling around with someone else. And we, I fell backwards from the dock. With, we're, at, we're in college. So all this, it was scamp camp, so it was like second and third graders, and I'm the one who's like drowning, drowning. So I am beyond where I can reach on the ground, and I'm, I have water in my lungs, obviously, and I'm up and I'm trying to tread water, and I'm trying to spit out so that I can breathe. What it looked like, my friend Nick was the lifeguard, what it looked like to Nick was that I was going like this. So he gets his like red like lifeguard thing, right, to like come and rescue me. What I'm trying to tell him is please do not rescue me because that would be very embarrassing. I don't want you to rescue me, but I couldn't talk. So what that looked like was me going like this, which was me trying to say to Nick, please don't rescue me. These are second and third graders. I don't want you to rescue me. I'm just gonna tread water until I can stand. But he couldn't understand me because I couldn't talk because I had swallowed water. So all he saw was me waving my hand ferociously while I'm spitting out water. And he thought, Allison needs to be rescued. So he put his red thing on, he's out, he's swimming, he's rescuing me, getting me to land, where then once, and I, when he gets to rescue me, I use all my energy to fight him off. I fight off my rescuer. I'm elbowing, I'm kicking, I'm thrashing, because I do not want the kids to see me being brought in by Nick. That would be so embarrassing. I don't want them to watch me do that. So I'm trying everything. And Nick is swimming around me in a very slow circle, he says, Allison, here's the deal. I'm going to bring you in. We have two ways of doing this. I can wait until you pass out and bring you in passed out, or you can relax, and I can bring you in. Oh. So I'm like trying, you know, and so he's just circling around me with his, because he's not letting me bring him down, because every time, apparently, when you elbow a lifeguard or push a lifeguard, that's dangerous for the lifeguard. Who knew? Um, so he's like, I'm just going to circle around you and wait until you've calmed down or until you pass out, then I'll bring you in. And Nick is patient, so I was like, he's going to do this. He really is. All right. So I wait until I realize that I cannot kick him away. And I just take a deep breath, with, even though I can't breathe, and it still looks like this. And Nick scoops me up, and he carries, he like rescues me to the ground, to the sand. And I'm spitting up water. I'm coughing. I'm whatever. And all the little kids are like, Nick. You just saved her life. I'm like, no, he did not. He did not. I would have been fine. So what I say about this, I was mad at Nick for several days. I was like, how dare you try to save my life? How dare you rescue me? He's like, Allison, this is not the common response of someone whose life you saved. I'm like, you did not. I would have been OK if you would have given me my space. But years later, my friend Andrew was being, tra being trained to be a lifeguard, and I was giving Andrew rides to get a lifeguard certification, I said, oh, Andrew, I was once rescued by someone and they shouldn't have rescued me. And Andrew said, well, Allison, when you were fell off the dock, I said, I didn't fall off, I was pushed off. Okay, I'm stubborn. So when you were pushed off the dock, um, were you making forward movement? And I said, no, I was treading. He said, lifeguards are trained. If the person who's drowning in their problems, there's an analogy coming, cannot make forward movement, we have to get involved. If they can make forward movement, if you see that they're making forward movement, 
You can give them their space, but if they are not making forward movement, you have to get involved. Your friend Nick did the right thing. So then I had to like text Nick like a decade later, be like, sorry Nick for being mad at you for saving my life. I guess it was good. Um, but the meaning of this, if your friends are drowning online, if your friends are struggling online, they might not ask for help. They might actively elbow you, kick you, and push you away. They might not be happy with you helping them. If your friends are in a relationship that's dangerous, they might not love that you get adults involved. They might actively be kicking, punching, pushing you away. Hopefully not really kicking, punching. It might be 10 years later when you get a text being like, thanks for doing that. That was a good thing. If your friends are not making forward movement, if they're in over their heads, it's time to do the right thing as a friend and to help out. So I'm going to pause there.